Okay, so let's take a closer look at bacteria. All right, this is part of our domains and kingdoms lectures. Uh, but let's look at the characteristics, classification, energy, reproduction, and positive and negatives uh, that are all associated with bacteria. Now, there are some uh, questions, as usual, that we want to be able to answer when we're done. Um, we want to know the major characteristics of bacteria. We want to know some of their major shapes and the arrangements that we might use to classify bacteria. We want to know how they're using energy and where they get it from. And we want to be able to describe some of their reproduction. All right. So let's just jump right in. Uh, bacteria are single celled organisms. They are smaller than eukaryotic cells. They do not have a nucleus, which means they are prokaryotes. They have cell walls and they have a circular chromosome. We usually call that a plasmid, all right? Um, or we can call that a plasmid. Okay, so if you see plasmid, think circular chromosome. Um, now back when I was in school, we called them monarins. Uh, but they don't do that anymore. That's just an older name for it. Um, they are plentiful, and they're found all over the place. You can go out and, you know, look at some water from a puddle under a microscope. You're probably going to find some bacteria. Um, definitely underneath, you know, your seat, uh, probably on your walls. You can find them on your skin. They are really, really, really fast um, at reproducing, um, and obviously their life cycle is quick uh, to, to match that. Now, when we talk about circular DNA uh, or a plasmid, this is usually what we're um, looking at. So when you see an image of a D or of a, of a bacteria, right, a lot of times we'll, we'll draw one of these rod-shaped bacterias, and we usually just draw a little wavy circle in the middle, and we say, hey, that's uh, DNA. Well, it's still the double helix, right? So it's still spun around and around and around and around, all right? Uh, but we don't usually draw the helices we just draw it as that circle. Now, bacterial shape is really important to how we name bacteria. Um, the bacillus is the rod-shaped bacteria. Coccus is a sphere-shaped bacteria. We have spirillium, which are the spiral bacteria. And those are the three main shapes you want to know. So bacillus, coccus, and spirillium. Rod-shaped, spherical, and spiral. We could also describe bacteria based on the colonies that they um, organize themselves into. Sometimes if they organize into, say, groups of two, we'll call them diplo. If they go into strands, we'll call them strepto, and clumps we call staph or staphyl. So if you see like streptococcus, which is the bacteria that can give you strep throat, that is a bunch of spherical bacteria in a straight strand. If you were to see, say, um, Staphylococcus, right? That's the picture that we have drawn right here. We just have a clump of uh, spherical bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus, um, which is Latin for gold, um, which is the color of the specific bacteria there, um, is the bacteria that will give you a staph infection. If you saw, say, diplobacillus, well, that would mean we have two rod-shaped bacteria, and they're kind of hooked together as a pair, right? So we can use these names and these arrangements in order to name or identify our bacteria. Here are some examples. I know we saw this uh, in the overview on classification, but just to look at it again, um, here you can see, so this would be uh, streptococcus, right? This would be diplococcus right here, a pair. Um, you know, here would be staphylococcus, all right? Um, so a lot of different ways that we can talk about our bacteria. Now, most bacteria are hetero heterotrophs. That's really important to know. Um, they don't make their own food. They get it from their surroundings. There are some bacteria that are... Um, uh, classified as decomposers, excuse me, we call them saprophytes. Uh, and then we also have some bacteria like cyanobacteria, which are autotrophs. So there are heterotrophic bacteria, they're autotrophic bacteria. We also have bacteria that are kind of like fungi in that they decompose things, and we call them saprophytes. So make sure you know all three of those facts. This is a great picture of E. coli. I believe this is on a tongue or perhaps on an intestinal wall, I'm not sure which, uh, just looking at the picture. 
But E. coli is one of those bacteria that you're probably really familiar with. We're going to talk more about it later. Um, but take a minute, look at this picture, see if you can identify um, maybe its structural arrangement. Now, when we look at respiration of our cells, we know that we're anaer or we are aerobic. Excuse me. Uh, we require oxygen in order to break down um, molecules in order to make energy. Bacteria can be anaerobic or aerobic. All right, and the aerobic ones are, you know, free living. Oxygen doesn't really bother them. If you're an anaerobe, though, oxygen may actually be poisonous to you. One of the things that we do as scientists or as uh, in the medical field or in the, just when we're studying bacteria, say in um, maybe a microbiology class or a microbiology um, field of study, that uh, one of the things that we do is we try to identify how much oxygen tolerance a specific organism may have. And so this is a pretty common test here. Um, we use maybe agar, which is a jelly-like uh, substance, and we we fill a test tube full of it, and then we inoculate the agar with our uh, bacteria, and then we let it grow. Um, agar has nutrients in it, and we come back and we see where it's colonized. So if it's only colonized at the top, well, we know that there's oxygen in the air, and so a little bit of oxygen can get in and out of the um, the agar, but if it's only near the top, we said that's an obligate anaerobe. Now, this word obligate means required, all right? Um, if it goes a little deeper, right, a little bit lower than the top, so we might say it's a microaerophile. File means to love, so it likes oxygen. If we have a cluster at the top and then also colonies spread throughout, we'll say it's a faculative anaerobe, which means um, it's anaerobic, right, because way down here, we know that there is no oxygen at all, uh, but it can grow in the presence of oxygen near the top. If there's no big colony set at the top, like in this other one here, this blue one, um, then we say it's aerotolerant anaerobe, so it still can definitely grow at the bottom, so that tells us it's an anaerobe, but it doesn't really like or love oxygen. And then if it's only clustered at the bottom, we say that we have an obligate anaerobe, which means O2 would be a poison. So that would be a bacteria that can't live in the presence of oxygen. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Another thing that we like to look at when we study bacteria is their reproduction. There's two main ways that bacteria reproduce. There is binary fission, which is when they grow and split into two identical cells. It's very similar to mitosis. And then there is conjugation, and conjugation is what makes bacteria uh, so adaptable. Basically, two bacteria pull up next to each other, park, hook up um, a little a little leader line, and they can uh, share some DNA back and forth, and that kind of gives them the ability to um, increase the amount of mutation that their DNA is subject to. Now, something that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's not exactly reproduction, but it's similar. Um, bacteria can make endospores, in which case, if the conditions for where they're living are really terrible, they just kind of cocoon themselves inside these endospores, and they wait until the conditions are a little bit better. So here's some cool little images for you. Um, this would be uh, binary fission right here. This purple rod-shaped bacteria is undergoing binary fission, where it's just um, separating into two clones, two daughter cells. The top one here shows conjugation, and so DNA can move through these leader lines from one bacteria to another, and this allows them to adapt to the environment much quicker than you and I might be able to. And down here at the bottom, we have an endospore, where in this core here, this is the bacteria. It's just kind of sitting there waiting. Um, and this exosporium around it is a very hard protective shell, uh, which allows it to kind of hibernate until conditions improve. Now, when we're identifying bacteria, uh, one of the things that we look at is their cell wall, because the cell wall structure of a bacteria is really important to understand if you're going to try to kill one with an antibiotic. A lot of antibiotics um, work by 
preventing the bacteria from being able to close off its cell wall. And so it ends up with a cell wall full of holes and the bacteria just kind of, you know, leaks out and dies. Um, but in order to, to get that to work, you got to make sure you, that the bacteria has the right cell wall. So in order to do that, we do a gram stain. And a gram stain uses colors to identify whether we have one cell wall or two cell walls. If a bacteria is gram positive, it only has one cell wall. If it's gram negative, then it must have two cell walls. So you can, I'm just going to flip back here. You can probably see the difference in the two cell walls pretty clearly. Um, in our gram negative bacteria, it looks like we have the three layers. We're in a gram positive bacteria, it appears that we only have the two layers. All right. Now, before we, you know, jump off and think that all bacteria are terrible, terrible things and we just want to kill them, that's not actually the case, right? We rely on bacteria for a lot of things. They help us produce food like cheeses and yogurts. Um, beer is produced using, um, oh, sorry, beer is produced using yeast, not bacteria. That's a fungus. We'll talk about that later. Um, but they also help us digest our food. And in the environment, they can cycle the nutrients. So when you learned about the nitrogen cycle in earth science, um, that requires bacteria that live in the roots of plants or live on the roots of plants to fix the nitrogen in the air into a nitrogen that can be used. Human beings also use bacteria to break down stuff like sewage, waste, oil, things that we don't want to deal with. However, bacteria can cause problems, right? That is something that we're aware of. Uh, they can cause diseases, right? And we usually call the bacteria that cause disease pathogens. Um, and another thing that they do that's pretty annoying is they can spoil our food. Now, the individual who's responsible for uh, identifying a, um, a method to determine whether or not a bacteria is a pathogen uh, was Robert Koch. And Robert Koch's postulates are pretty famous. We still use them today. Uh, and this is what they said. If you think you have a bacteria that causes a disease, you should always find that bacteria in the body of a sick person, but you shouldn't find it in a healthy person. You should be able to isolate the microbe and purify it. So you should be able to get the microbe by itself and then put it on like an agar uh, petri dish or an agar plate, and it should grow and reproduce, and it should be a pure culture. If you take that microbe, once it's isolated and purified, and inject it into a new healthy person, they should become sick. And then once that sick person is good and sick, you should be able to re-isolate that same microbe from the host, all right? Now, obviously, we don't go around sticking people with microbes. We usually use rabbits for this because the rabbit immune system is pretty similar to human beings, but Koch's postulate, uh, postulates are uh, pretty important for determining whether or not an organism causes a disease. If you can tell a bacteria apart, if you know a bacteria causes a specific disease, then you can start to work for a cure that attacks just that bacteria. So some things you might want to know. Is the bacteria anaerobic or aerobic? Is it a eukaryote or a prokaryote, right? We do the gram test for positive or negative. We want to know its shape. We want to know its arrangement. We want to know what it grows in. Will it grow in regular agar? Um, will it grow in blood agar, which is agar with blood mixed into it? Agar is made from potato starch, or at least old um, agar is. Maybe it grows in chocolate agar. Um, will it grow in a lot of different stuff? Is it very specific as to its diet on what it grows in? There are many, 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 many questions you ask. This is called um, microbiology, right? The study of microbes, okay? So there are many, many, many tests we do to try to identify and classify and, you know, ultimately name a bacteria so that we can um, find a cure for whatever disease that bacteria might call, cause. Now, speaking of antibiotics, it's important to kind of, you know, understand a little bit about how they work. Um, antibiotics means against life, right? Anti is against, bio is life. Um, they kill bacteria. That's what they're used for. Um, if you overuse antibiotics, you actually will kill all of the weak bacteria, and the ones that remain will be resistant to your antibiotics, so that's bad. Um, but if we want to figure out, will an antibiotic kill a specific bacteria, what we look for is called a zone of interference on a Petri dish. So we take a Petri dish, we put agar in it, and we put our bacteria on there, and we let it grow and 
divide and multiply until it covers the whole petri dish. And then we take a little piece of filter paper or some kind of absorbent paper that has our antibiotics soaked in it, and we sit it right in the middle of the petri dish and we wait to see um, how many of the bacteria start to die. The bigger the zone of interference, the better the antibiotic. So here's a great example of a um, bunch of different antibiotics being tested against two different bacteria. Um, the Staphylococcus, I believe it's Staphylococcus albus, um, is albus means from, from the white uh, because it's a white colored bacteria there. And you can see that if you look at this, we have quite a few zones of interference. So this is a pretty well-defined zone of interference for this uh, antibiotic right there. Uh, this red one also has a pretty good zone of interference, as does this one. And so we have different back, different uh, antibiotics on each of these little tabs. We can see that this one right here, not working very well at all. Excuse me. Although this one against M. luteus is working very well, right? So we have the same antibiotics, two different bacteria. We can see that some work on certain species and not others. So if you had this infection, well, maybe that would be a good bacteria or antibiotic to try. Although, from the looks of things, these two antibiotics have done really well, kind of wiping out the population. So they may also be pretty good. All right, so that's the zone of interference. Okay, so hopefully you can tell me some of the major characteristics of bacteria now. You can identify some shapes and some arrangements. You can tell me about an autotroph, a heterotroph, and a saprophyte. All right, how they get in, how bacteria get and use their energy, and you can talk about how they reproduce. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll be glad to give you a hand.